Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected. Uh, yeah, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, bearing with us, getting through some AV difficulties um, starting up. I blame, uh, I, I blame gremlins in the system. I'm, Dr. Weber knows what he's doing. I am Major Ian Brown. I'm the Operations Officer at the Krulak Center, and on behalf of Marine Corps University, the Marine Corps University Foundation, and the Brew Krulak Center for Innovation and Creativity, welcome to the Brewcast. This is our fourth episode of a series designed to connect the worlds of the warfighter and PME with the best in innovative and creative thought. So before we begin, as always, please remember that all opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not reflect the views of the Krulak Center, Marine Corps University, the United States Marine Corps, or any other agency of the US government. We are also recording this webcast today for the benefit of all those in our community of interest who can't join us right now. So we ask that you be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disrupting the presentation, as well as turn off your own webcams to help us stream smoothly. So today's broadcast features, as you already know, Dr. Yuval Weber. He is our Donald Friend Chair of Russian Military and Political Strategy here at the Krulak Center. Previously, he's worked at the Kennan Institute, um, as well as the Daniel Morgan Graduate School of National Security. He's also taught at Harvard University and has been a, a research fellow at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. He also has a very, uh, um, he's a frequent guest on U.S. and international media and uh, regularly appears on uh, podcasts and webcasts. So today he's going to be talking about Russian private military companies. And before we get going and I turn it back to him, I'd like to ask one last time that everyone in the audience make sure your microphones are muted and cameras off so that uh, we have a smooth presentation. We will have a question and answer session at the very end. Um, however, if, you, if there's something that Dr. Weber is talking about that you specifically would like him to address in the course of the conversation, just go ahead and type it in the chat window. I'll be monitoring that throughout the presentation so that I can get the question to him while he's talking about it. Otherwise, for your more general questions, just, I ask that you please wait until the presentation is over. And again, type it in the group chat and I'll do my best to go through as many questions as I can um, before we conclude. So with that, Dr. Weber, back to you. So thank you, thank you very much, Major Brown. Um, so uh, one other thing that I want to mention before I launch into it is that I'm going to mention a great number of papers and reports uh, just throughout the, the presentation. So when we post this video and these slides, because I'll make these slides available to whoever wants them, I'm also going to attach a bibliography of reading both scholarly and popular works on Russian private military companies, as well as private military companies in general, so that anyone who's interested in further reading can not only reach out to me personally, but can look at all the things that I use in order to prepare this presentation. One of the great things that we do at Krulak Center is that we're available to the larger Marine Corps and defense enterprise community. So please just consider me and us a resource for you. So with all that said, Russian private military companies and great power competition. Um, as we can see here from the, you know, the very pictures uh, presented, uh, we have, I don't know how many people would be able to, to guess who that is, but that is the General Haftar, who's trying to take uh, from the top left. That is General Haftar when he was in Moscow. Um, he's the guy who's trying to take over Libya and he's doing it with Russian assistance. And as you can tell from the Ushanka hat, which he does not look very natural when wearing, um, that is him at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow. In the middle is a um, Russian military trainer who is training the crack unit of Central African Republic uh, gentlemen in front of him. And then there is on the right, uh, Putin standing proudly at the Russia-Africa summit, uh, which was held a few months ago in Sochi, Russia. And so there's going to be really two big takeaways from uh, the talk today. One is that private military companies in Russia are not very private at all. There is money that goes to private individuals. Those private individuals work for Putin and thus they work for the Russian state. So the private, and this is going to be one of the things that I'll talk about, is really sort of trying to, you know, smuggle this type of organization into um, a category that is most often used for those firms coming from the United States, UK, and other uh, Western countries. 
And the second big takeaway is that all of this stuff that we're going to talk about, these PMCs or PMSCs, as I'll discuss, is really about Russia's prosecution of great power competition. So in terms of the plan, because I want to make sure everyone knows this is only going to take about an hour or so, uh, as, as we've said before, an hour is a good amount of time for this. Um, we'll talk about what is Russia's grand strategy and its great power competition, talk about Russian, uh, talk about private military and security companies, and really how do Russian PMSCs differ in their Cold War origins and command and control compared to their Western counterparts. And finally, we'll end up where, where have Russian uh, companies uh, been deployed, what have they done, and where might we expect them next? And the bottom line up front, the Russian private military and security companies fulfill numerous roles to help Russia prosecute great power competition. That is the core thing right there. These are parastatal armies that serve as shadow special forces for plausible and implausible deniability of Russian military action abroad. They are sources of profit for their leaders. And here is going to be where um, I'm really going to break with a lot of the literature. A lot of the literature tries to put these Russian firms like Wagner, most famously, into basically um, trying to compare and contrast with things like Blackwater or KBR or DynCorp or all these other you know, executive outcomes, all these really well-known Western firms. My contention here, and this is where I depart from the literature, is that a Russian private military company, a mm -hmm. private military and security company, is part, just one part, of the full suite of Russia's client management services. They can offer, in terms of the whole deal, defensive and offensive kinetic capabilities, social media and electoral manipulation, regime maintenance, and assistance in breaking international laws and conventions. Armed force is just one of those things. So Wagner, as we'll talk about you know, as a specific example, is partly run by Yevgeny Prigozhin, who's you know, obviously most famous as Putin's chef. As we'll discuss in depth, Prigozhin, who is a, his background is in armed robbery and catering, so obviously not you know, someone who comes from the military universe, um, he is a person whose real value is being part of Putin's court and having administrative capabilities. And his Concord Management Group has Wagner as just one of its companies. It also has the Internet Research Agency. It also has um, Ria Fan uh, Patriot Media Group, which is something that actually creates the disinfo that we see um, across the world. So Wagner is not a thing that stands alone. It's part of a suite of services. So really the first thing and where we have to begin, so it's, I'm not just describing things that you can read and report, but to place these, um, these private military and security companies within some sort of theoretical context so that we figure out why Russia needs them and how Russia uses them. So on the right, you will see two pictures. One is a cartoon, a historical cartoon, that depicts the signing of the, the, the peace treaty that ended the Napoleonic Wars. That's the Congress of Vienna. And on the bottom, most people will recognize a bit more easily uh, General Douglas MacArthur, and that's signing uh, Japan's surrender. So in terms of what Great Power War does, it clarifies the relative rankings of winners and losers proxied by the peace treaty signed thereafter or the peace settlement reached. And whether it is bringing the losers in, as uh, France was brought into uh, the Congress of Vienna, or it is taking unconditional surrender, as what is happening to the Japanese in the bottom there, it doesn't really matter how they get there. But what really matters is that at the end of a great power war, it is one of the few times in which the rankings of who's left is actually quite clear. So among those remaining great powers, it sets out how do they interact with each other in terms of great power confrontation, you know, the bilateral fight of U.S. versus USSR, or perhaps U.S. versus China today. But it also sets out how do these states engage in hierarchy building, building these spheres of influence with non-great powers, as well as what is happening inside of those great powers to fund those military and diplomatic efforts abroad. And where great power competition, the thing 
you know, the, the national security strategy places as its core uh, pursuit for the United States right now, the, the Trump one of 2017, is that great power competition emerges because life goes on. None of these things remain constant. Where the United States and Japan were in 1945 is not where they are in 1980 or in 2020. So where do we have it for Russia? Like, you know, let's get stuck in immediately. It is really, and this is a, one of the core things, I, I lived for, I think, four years in Russia, and the thing that I heard from the Russian foreign policy elite day in, day out, is you guys totally screwed us in the end of the Soviet period in 1991. Where the Russian foreign policy elite looks to is they look at the end of the Cold War in 1989 being the moment in which the United States and the Soviet Union came to a deal that would have settled all the issues between the two great superpowers. And so from on the top left, we have, um, you know, back when Time Magazine was a really big deal, we have H.W. Bush and Mikhail Gorbachev who are coming together at the conclusion of the, um, the, the fall of socialist governments in Eastern Central Europe. They come together in the Malta summit December 1989, and they say to each other, are you going to, you know, Bush says to Gorbachev, you know, it's one thing if Bulgaria goes, but what about East Germany? And what Gorbachev answers is uh, what became known as the Sinatra Doctrine, uh, you know, from the song My Way. He said that each one of these socialist governments in uh, Eastern and Central Europe are going to find their own way towards building socialism in their country even if it means losing power and getting out. That is the moment in which the Soviet Union and the United States come to a generic and undefined agreement. Somehow they're gonna jointly govern international relations um, and what's going to happen between the two states is unclear, but because the Soviet Union still exists, there's gonna be all these neutral buffer states between them. There's less need for cultivating allies and clients between the two blocks. And what Gorbachev is going to do is reboot the domestic economy and political life. Obviously, what happens is that the Soviet Union and the United States bring the Cold War to an end. But Boris Yeltsin, shown in the bottom left as leading the Russian Revolution, and in the top right with his colleagues from Ukraine and Belarus, they pull the Slavic core out of the Soviet Union and they bring the Soviet Union to an end. What is the reality that happens thereafter? is that in the international order, the international liberal order that we've been talking about you know, for the last number of years, it begins in 1991 instead of 1989. The US increases its power, NATO expands, Yeltsin loses control of everything. And uh, you know, in the New York Times Magazine uh, where myself and a, a co-author are quoted, we basically talk about this distinction. The Soviets, and then the Russians believe that the world should begin in 1989. The rest of the world actually moves forward from 1991. So this 1989 versus 1991 distinction, that is the core thing that Putin is trying to bring to an end and to make the world look more like 89 than 91 and to bring Russia back to the level of great power where it can negotiate as an equal with the US. That's the core thing that he's been doing for his 20 years in office and what after the next referendum, you know, he'll be looking for the next 16. So in terms of what can great powers do domestically, he's basically ended political competition and he's made the Russian state the primary economic actor. In terms of great power confrontation, there's many things that Putin has done, but he has certainly not uh, oversold what the Russia can do against the United States. He has ceded blue water naval competition to China, and he has not increased the size of the army and has tried to make the, the, the army smaller and professional with less reliance on conscript, because he recognizes that in this contemporary era, there's no war that Russia is going to win directly against the United States. So if he can't really, do, can't really get to be a great power to make the world look like 1989 through great power confrontation, it has to be through the other thing, which is building bigger and bigger spheres of influence, building a larger hierarchy to then renegotiate 
with the United States from a position of power. And this is what we've seen over the last number of years. We can see from the left, Russian soldiers on their way to Tbilisi in 2008, one of the greatest influence operations uh, in history is a, an unmarked little green man uh, handing a cat to a local boy in Crimea. And, you know, if you remember nothing else from this uh, presentation, remember this, Russians, largely urban society, they're cat people. Because they're cat people, this cat was found and this boy was found in order to provide this photo opportunity in which a cat is given to a young boy so that you focus in on that human connection and not the fact that this man is heavily armed and has no insignia. That's how you press the emotional buttons in Russia. And then obviously what we can see on the right is um, a, a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, the leaders of uh, Hezbollah, Iran, Syria, and Russia, in which obviously uh, Putin there is to demonstrate projecting power and border and transborder regions, and finally, to be active in different theaters to demonstrate great powerness. So finally, we get to what are private military companies. And when I was preparing for this talk, I went on um, Facebook to just like see the uh, pictures of various people that I was looking up who could identify themselves as belonging to PMCs. And I have found that in terms of group photos, um, teenagers in high school and early and like fraternity sorority people, uh, as well as people in PMCs, love group photos to an extent that I think is unmatched in human history. It's just group photo after group photo. Um, and so we see at the top a bunch of American guys, and what we see at the bottom is uh, <laughs> a bunch of Russian guys, um, but fulfilling the same function demonstrating their identity, demonstrating uh, what it is that they do when they're not at home. That said, the notion of how to define a private military company or private military and security company has been really contested within the literature. Um, and that's because there is as yet no totally agreed upon term for what it is these people in both of these pictures are doing. So I've listed there on the left a number of different um, definitions that come from the literature, which basically take it from mercenaries, uh, from Percy 2007, which is the distinction of people who only fight for money as opposed to ideology or state service, and then going through military enterprises, semi-state informal security organizations, private military firms, and Sean McFate's recent uh, definition of expeditionary conflict entrepreneurs structured as multinational corporations that use lethal force or train others to do so. All of those are basically, you know, usable if you'd like. However, the one sort of like definition that I think has been easiest to use and which is starting to gain more traction because it has buy-in from the Red Cross, which helped organize an international document to set basic standards for, uh, for you know, private militarized companies, is the, the definition private military and security company. And Matthew and Darden argue that this is preferable over mercenary in corporate terms because it best describes the full range of services firms can offer and be, can become the international standard. So in essence, to lose specificity, it gains some amount of buy-in. And one of the reasons that these private military and security companies the reason that it's difficult to sort of figure out what, what do all these different types of firms do is because they really vary in terms of the level of force that they use to get what they want or to you know, please their clients and so on and so forth. And so from, this is from uh, uh, Major Thomas who wrote in Military Review and Peter Singer who wrote an earlier book. They uh, distribute the types of firms by the level of force that is used. And they go from least to most um, military support firms, military consulting firms, private security companies, and private military companies, which then go, as you can see on the screen, lots of different sorts of things. Sustaining troops in the field, doing things that doesn't involve actual shooting, defensive action, and then offensive action. And at the bottom, I've given to use a number of these um, 
American and then Russian counterparts. And as you can see, KBR, huge firm, they basically do everything that isn't, you know, there's not the fighting. Uh, they put the food, make sure everything is right. But what we can see is, you know, DynCorp as a military consulting firm, Blackwater, which uh, has turned into several different things, as well as Eric Prince's current uh, Chinese, sort of the major shareholder of his current firm is a, is a Chinese state-owned company um, called, uh, which is uh, investing in his Frontier Services Group, which is Africa-focused, um, as well as a few Russian ones that are in italics. What is different among the Russian groups is that you can see the Moran Group and the RSB Group, which are private security companies, which basically operate roughly like the PMCs that we generally think about. What is the interesting thing about Wagner? And the reason that you know this entire discussion is based around trying to figure out how does Wagner work in Russian foreign policy, as well as Russian domestic politics, is that it does several different things. It does military consulting, it does private defensive work, and it also does private offensive work. So the thing that we need to figure out in terms of figuring out where does Wagner fit in all this is why it seems to define easy, um, easy definition. And why, you know, in a sense, like why I mentioned, uh, Eric Prince working with the with the Chinese government is could you imagine you know Wagner working for an American firm or working for a Chinese firm? It's probably pretty unlikely. They really do have only one customer, and that customer has varied needs. So, what are the origins of the the of the Russian PMSC uh, before you know the before the Soviet Union, and then at the before the Putin years. In you know, the annals of history, uh, Russia has numerous times used private groups of some variety or another. Um, in, the, in the time of Ivan the Terrible, uh, Ivan IV, uh, he was fighting a number of wars to his west, and one of the very first foreigners that he hired to be Russia's basically first war admiral um, you know, fleet admiral was Karsten Rode, a Danish privateer. Uh, Karsten Rode had a number of his own ships. He had his own fighting force. And Ivan the Terrible did not have the time or the money in order to build and train his own. So he just bought one off the shelf. So this has happened before. Uh, Yermak Timofeyevich uh, was paid by the Stroganov family um, in the 16th century in order to help colonize Siberia and extend the... Um, the extent of Russian rule all the way until the Pacific, which happened, you know, sometime after him. But it was a private individual hired by a private family who was working for the glory of the state. And of course, numerous times in Russian history, the Cossacks, which are in a sense um, escaped serfs who developed their own martial culture uh, and who worked with the Russian uh, state in order to patrol the edges of empire. So there have been numerous times in Russian history in which the state has outsourced some aspect of its defense and offense to individuals or groups in order to fulfill their state building or, or expansionist needs. So in more modern times, where are the post-Soviet, you know, pre-Putin origins of Russian private military and security companies? This is really one of the issues that comes from the 1990s. As one can imagine, the, the Soviet Union was this really big, bad thing. It was a, it had a, it had, the Communist Party of the Soviet Union was involved in every aspect of political and economic and social life in the Soviet Union. And Yeltsin's key hatred was not only, you know, bringing down the Soviet Union as a country, but really breaking the ability of the Communist Party to control every aspect of, you know, Russian life. So when he took, when he banned the Communist Party, when he took the so Russia out of the Soviet Union, what was left thereafter was a fragmentation of political, social, and economic control. And Denis Volkov um, described this era as, you know, something like the Wild West, in which there was no real clear source of one monopoly on the the use of organized violence, to use the Weberian. A definition, but instead 
a numerous amount of violent entrepreneurs who organized private violence during this commercial free-for-all. And what Suhanin has described as, you know, very pithily, protection for concessions. So if we think of the, the literature from Charles Tilley about the state as a protection racket, what we have is individuals who use, uh, you know, state as the reason, who use war as, who use the phrase, war made the state and the state made war. So because there was no monopoly on the use of organized violence, that there were entrepreneurs who took that opportunity to build up these protection rackets, which had state-like features to them. And this is in Mark Galliotti's, um, not his most recent book, but the book before that, is he described the privatization of the monopoly of violence under the Yeltsin period as paving the way for a criminal state synergy where criminal groups work for the state when necessary. And in Galliotti's book, in terms of like, where does the Russian mafia come from in a way, he's talking about all these, um, all these criminal groups, which not only, you know, engage in protection rackets, you know, they extract value from the rest of society, but where, for instance, um, you know, commercial good distribution networks have broken down, they were able to put goods in shops during the 1990s. They were able to organize safety on the streets when the police uh, were unable to do so. And so when uh, Putin comes into power, instead of trying to destroy all these uh, organized criminal groups, which would then create another round of you know, violent competition between criminal groups and the state, is he just co-opted them into state service when their function did not interfere with Putin. Therefore, Putin made himself, and this is sort of what the literature on Putin's state building um, says, is that Putin did not break any of these organized crime networks, but just put himself and the Russian state on top of all of them. And that's how Putin is able to maintain organized discipline, both uh, overtly as well as covertly. And it's been argued that, in effect, the Russian FSB is the largest criminal organized organized criminal group in all of Russia because it's the biggest group in Moscow and Moscow is the richest place in the whole country. But let's not divert too far. But what this means is when we think about the, the example of the 1990s at home, we have a sense of disorganized uh, banditry, disorganized um, organization of the state and that there are private groups which can both organize violence and then work with the state in order to uh, do good for themselves as well as do good for the states. So when we can think of private military and security companies, we can think of these as foreign versions of domestic protection rackets. And I'll explain further as we go along. We can also have in terms of the post-Soviet origins of these Russian groups is that Russia was doing this even before Putin came into office. In terms of ideological interests, um, Alpha, Vimpo, these, uh, these KGB groups uh, developed these private, in essence, for hire um, organizations, uh, as well as the, the Russian uh, Federal uh, Protective Service, uh, who developed a group called Rubicon, who found people who were ideologically motivated to go to Serbia and Kosovo as it was fighting its wars against the Serbs, the Bosnians, um, and then against the, the West broadly. Private groups were also used in patrolling the borders of Russia and intervening into the post-Soviet conflict, such as Tajikistan, Transnistria, Nagorno-Karabakh. Um, in Tajikistan, there was a civil war, and the, the Russian groups came in, both overtly and covertly, in order to fight alongside the pro-regime elements against the democracy activists. In Transnistria, the existing Russian army, 10th Army, which was stationed there, did not redeploy back to Russia and became part of a state-private nexus. And Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, Russian contract soldiers fought along regular Russian soldiers in order to uh, bring that civil conflict um, to the status quo situation it is right now. And then finally, again, um, Mark Galliotti has written a lot about this. Uh, Russian contractors were also used uh, to supplement state forces in Chechnya. 
And a lot of the sort of violence, drunkenness, uh, conflicts with the civil population happen from these groups. So PMCs in the Putin era. As you can see on the right, there are a number of groups. Obviously what people focus in on most is Wagner because that's the one that in this, uh, in this marketplace has emerged as the, the biggest and the baddest of them all. But Wagner is by no means the only one. Um, the recentralization of political and economic power means that PMCs, sort of like the 1990s, but much more so, work with and for the state. And this is a key moment where we can find the difference between uh, these Russian firms and Western firms. Western firms, you know, Eric Prince's group and you know, many of the others are fairly autonomous in terms of they don't take uh, you know, explicit direction from the state, like from their home government in terms of what they do. Obviously when they get contracts, they do whatever the contract says, but they're not waiting for instructions. Um, whereas those firms seek to maximize profit, these Russian firms are explicitly parastatal. They work on top of and with the state and, and bottom of the state um, with patrons who are themselves clients of Putin. So for instance, Wagner, as we've said, its patron is uh, Yevgeny Perigozhin. Perigozhin may be the patron of that group, but he is a client of Putin. And that's the mechanism by which the informality of these relationships, Putin to Prigozhin to Wagner, it, that's what's able to maintain both um, uh, Wagner's ability to gain access to uh, money-making opportunities abroad, as well as identifying the person they need to uh, please. They're not pleasing Prigozhin fundamentally, they're pre pleasing Prigozhin, who's trying to figure out the ways that Putin wants to be pleased himself. And what is a distinction, another distinction between uh, these Russian firms as well as, um, let's say, Western firms, is that they are subject to coercion for disobeying and are subject to rewards for cooperation because they are illegal under Russian law. Article 359 of Russia's um, criminal code expressly forbids mercenaryism. And here I wanted to read to you the distinctions as well as the loophole on where um, mercenaries fit within the Russian legal scheme. And now I'm, I'm quoting, and I just sort of wrote it down earlier, what is the definition of a mercenary, why it's illegal, and where the loophole is. The quote, recruitment, training, financing, or any other material provision of a mercenary, and also the use of him in an armed conflict or hostilities shall be punishable by deprivation of liberty for a term of four to eight years. Okay, pretty clear, you can't do any of that. However, if you're working for Russia, there's a big loophole in there. Quote, a mercenary shall be deemed to mean a person who acts for the purpose of getting a material reward and who is not a citizen of the state in whose armed conflict or hostilities he participates, who does not reside on a permanent basis on its territory, and who is not a person fulfilling official duties. So if there is a official reason to be in a particular conflict, that person is no longer an illegal mercenary, but is a person working for, at some level, the Russian state. And so this ambiguous legal position, are you a deniable uh, asset or not, comes from whether these groups are successful and whether these groups are necessary. And that's how we can start to think about the informality of the 1990s, how they became organized, but still tacit, how these can become externalized to explain that the violent entrepreneurs in the domestic situation of Russia in the 1990s has now been exported as a model to what's happening um, across Russia's border region and even further afield. And there we can start to see the much wider um, view on what uh, on the reasons for using these uh, PMSCs. Obviously, the quote unquote normal reasons and the reasons that PMSCs are used everywhere is that they're less politically and financially costly um, than uniformed soldiers. So if you know these people uh, die in, in terms of their combat, these are people who you know the Russian public would see as 
people who knew what they were doing and getting paid handsomely for it. So even if these people die in Ukraine or Syria or Libya, it doesn't have the same emotional affect as people who are serving their state. They have less social status, so therefore they're easy to use, easier to use. And they prevent public dissatisfaction with foreign policy actions abroad. That's for the overt stuff. But you know, we can start to see that there are several other reasons for using these PMSCs. Plausible deniability in a covert situation. They do not officially belong to the Russian state and can be a non-attributional means of coercion. This is pretty well known within the literature as well. But, and here's the, here's the thing, uh, what makes the, the Russian ones distinct from their Western counterparts. It's the implausible deniability. Um, a phrase uh, that many have used, including Stronsky in 2019, in which ludicrous denials of their command and control are useful, are useful in information confrontation by showing what the US and the West cannot stop. The use of Wagner in Ukraine, the use of Wagner in Crimea, the use of Wagner in uh, Libya, in Central African Republic, in Sudan, in Mozambique, and all these in uh, Venezuela, by not having them be official parts of the Russian military, their very presence are able to then show where Russia is. And those are the pictures that then go around the world in order to make Russia, for relatively little investment in terms of the actual cash involved, look like they are everywhere. And to really bigin, bigin themselves up relative to their actual capabilities in terms of uh, taking and holding territory, which is what one thinks of when one thinks of the things that states are supposed to do. And so it's this implausible deniability that is also a key information and influence tool. Uh, Profit-making enterprise for informal networks around Putin and other senior members of the Russian state apparatus. Um, and military emulation, where they demonstrate Russia's great powerness by performing activities commonly associated with great power peer competitors. Um, Reynolds, um, 2019, who had a, uh, uh, and this is from a report he did for the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, he cited from a R Russian newspaper the following quote by a a uh, Wagner fighter, where the Wagner fighter said, if you call us mercenaries, then aren't our soldiers mercenaries? They're also in contracts like we are. I can't even call American PMCs mercenaries because they also work for the state, for the State Department, for the CIA, for the Pentagon, or for some of the special services. And this is really one of the key aspects of what Russia tries to do is identify the thing that they want to do. Let's say crush domestic opposition. Well, then they say, actually, it's you and the uh, color revolution, which are actually doing it to us. So therefore, our anti-color revolution maneuvers, you know, building up a half million large uh, National Guard, uh, trying to manipulate the electoral processes in other countries. This is not us taking the initiative. This is us defending ourselves. And so part of that and, you know, using this military emulation argument um, that this uh, Wagner fighter is doing, you know, very directly is to say, of course, we are going to do this because you're doing it. And if you do it, why can't we? Because we're equal to you. And it's that military emulation, which is the argument for staking Russia's great power claims that leads to the use of, which is one of the reasons that leads to this use of PMSCs abroad. So we get to Wagner, the, the um, group that is used by the Russian military intelligence, where does it actually come from? Uh, its military chief is Dmitry Utkin, um, who on, in the picture on the left, it, he's with uh, Vladimir Putin and a few of his Wagner colleagues. This is when they are receiving a state medal for courage. What the action was for is obviously deeply classified, but this picture was released. Um, and apparently he is the, his call sign is Wagner uh, because he is a Third Reich enthusiast. And he, in battle, uh, he is taken to wear a Wehrmacht-style helmets. So he's, Nazi, he's a Nazi cosplayer, uh, in short. And that's where Wagner gets its name. Uh, on the right, uh, one of sort of the, the pictures that you don't often associate with uh, Prigozhin, uh, with the arrow as well, 
is when he was catering a state dinner with between obviously President Putin and President George W. Bush, and obviously him with the arrow. Wagner, as a private military and security company, grew out of a previous one called Slavana Corps. Um, and Utkin, who was a lieutenant colonel in the Russian Special Forces and part of Russian military intelligence, joined another group called Moran Group uh, in 2013. And Wagner was nothing special, and his predecessor, Slavana Corps, had actually ended in um, a total debacle. It had gotten involved in uh, basically a complete failure abroad in Syria. But what Utkin's basic genius uh, and what his real sort of source of success wasn't about fighting or wasn't about any organizational, um, you know, tactical insider or whatever else, but he re recruited Prigozhin to act as a patron and intermediary with Putin. And by having one of Putin's inner circle, and Prigozhin has no military background, as I mentioned before, his previous lines of work were armed robber and catering. Um, what Prigozhin really brought to the table is that he's a trusted member of Putin's court and he has really uh, incredible administrative capabilities in terms of understanding how things work on an informal basis in order to make the formal state uh, appear to operate smoothly. And so this is, in a sense, the same way where you get companies who, who bring in big shots to sit on their board of directors because those big shots bring in either political influence, they bring in a, a knowledge of how things work on the inside. This is, in effect, what Utkin and his group did. They brought in a big player, a real big kahuna. Obviously, that guy gets the, the major share of you know, the money that comes in, but they got Putin's ear with it. And that is the source of the value. And of course, what um, uh, Prigozhin does with that money is then he redistributes that onwards as well. And that is how Wagner, compared to all the other different uh, private military and security companies has been involved in every Russian fight and influence campaign since 2014. And the picture on the bottom there is um, uh, Wagner, obviously, which has both, uh, and this picture is uh, alleged to be uh, both uh, Russian citizens as well as Syrians who are now fighting in um, Libya. So, you know, part of expanding the reach into Syria. Um, where Wagner has been for a number of years is also to define is also to find a new source of labor for the fighting forces, people who are battle tested, uh, as it were. And so, but the fighting is just one thing that Russia uh, can do. What Russia can offer, and this is really sort of the core thing of trying to explain the different sorts of models of the 1990s and how they've become externalized is not to think of private military companies as, you know, groups who, like Russian ones, who only have, you know, one skill or expertise or only have one, you know, type of thing that they do. Um, what the Russian military companies do is several things. As we talked about, they have, you know, they can be military supply, they can be military support, they can be uh, defensive kinetic uh, action, offensive kinetic action. But what Prigozhin can, can really bring and what a number of these other Russian private military companies can bring is in effect this, um, this horizontal conglomeration of different types of actions in which the patrons of these groups, Prigozhin just being the most famous, can offer to any uh, foreign state. And that what these groups can do is be private service uh, uh, distributors of basically the Russian state writ large. And the things that go well can then become made official. Things that go poorly, of course, then, then can be ignored or denied. And so the full suite of intervention services, if you look to the left of the screen, is these are all the things that Wagner has done over the last uh, six plus years. They can attack your opponents if you need to maintain your hold on power, Syria. They can support your challenge to seize the state or to bring it down, such as in Libya or Ukraine. They can help get your com illegal commodities to market, 
such as in Central African Republic, protect you from regime change pressure, as by, let's say, being your presidential guard, such as in Venezuela. They can conduct disinformation campaigns and electoral manipulation, as has happened in Mozambique and Sudan. And sort of generically speaking, they can provide protection from the United States and China. Because Wagner, as a Russian representative, is not going to ask you about human rights abuses, is not going to ask you about authoritarianism, corruption, it's not going to ask for reforms, uh, as a, a U.S. company might. Uh, it won't interfere in your local labor markets, as certainly the Chinese will. So where the, the real comparative advantage of the Wagner and all these Russian firms is that they can offer a full panoply of things to help you as a, let's say, authoritarian leader do whatever it takes in order to take or seize power or hold on to power or, um, you know, just harass your opponents or kill your opponents. Whatever it is that you need, there's going to be a Russian service that can do it for you. And so the PM, PMSCs are part of what Russia can offer. Just as Wagner is just part of Prigozhin's Concord Management Company that includes the Internet Research Agency and the Patriot Media Group. The Internet Research Agency, you know, people might remember, this is actually part of the, um, the troll campaigns in the 2016 election uh, that helped swing the U.S. election uh, here. That was also Prigozhin. Prigozhin is not a computer wizard. It certainly does not have any special knowledge of the United States or of disinformation writ large, but, in the same, for, but for the same reason that he is um, heading up Wagner Group is the same reason he's heading up the IRA. It's that he can bring together the things that Putin needs on a deniable basis and then take the money for that either as a reward, you know, for doing the job directly um, or as a mechanism to get further contracts from the Russian state. The Patriot Media Group, this is the source of many of the actual misleading, and misleading videos that you see on the internet uh, and then get distributed. It's a group of several different information services, websites um, that actually help pump out the source material for the trolls uh, to distribute. So PMSCs are part of Russia's um, ability to get in involved in great power competition by having these different tools and services that are on offer to foreign leaders in order to build up Russia's hierarchies, its political and security hierarchies, and try to build up these different spheres of influence, but doing it on the cheap and not trying to compete with, let's say, the Americans in terms of you know, total lethality or with the Chinese in terms of just actual cash. What Russia is trying to do is come in the middle and find the things that they can do with no moral compunctions um, and at those edges of legality. And that's really where these Russian PMSCs that's where they operate. So when we see uh, the, you know, thread by Tim, Tim Colton, you know, as he's talking about, uh, you know, all these different groups, in his uh, most recent article, he described that really what brings together all these different groups is that it's emancipation from the blueprint of strict organizational hierarchy inherited from the Soviet past, improvisation, no great qualms about taking human life, and a psychology of acquisitiveness laced at the margins with nationalism and great powerism. And here's where we can start to see in terms of the behavior of Wagner and other groups abroad as being an external externalization of the behavior shown by domestic security companies and organized criminal groups inside of Russia in the 1990s, taken abroad to meet uh, both Russia's great power needs as well as their own profit needs. And finally, where I wanted to end, because again, I wanted to leave enough time for uh, questions, is these groups are unlikely to figure in direct fighting with U.S. forces or U.S. allied forces due to the gross mismatch in resources proved in Syria. They tried to attack a Kurdish-held um, gas field, and they got wiped out. They can perform important tasks in the information realm to embarrass Western rivals, and they can be used in preparing or shaping the battlefield as shadow special forces. Really, and so in, in conclusion, uh, thank you for your attention. What Wagner and all these other PMSCs 
are really then sort of geared to do is not really fight the United States, but to make the United States seem not present in certain areas of the world and to provide a bit more additional fighting force for Russian interests when it is not yet possible to commit um, Russian forces overtly. And so I, I think I actually went quite over, um, but I wanted to thank you for your attention. Um, these slides and all the things that I mentioned will be made available. So let me turn it over to Major Brown. Uh, Dr. Weber, again, thank you for a fantastic and engaging presentation. And for everyone else in the Team Krulak community who joined us today, thank you for tuning in. We hope you can join us next week where we'll be joined by uh, Dr. Amin Tarzi, who's the Director of Middle East Studies here at the Krulak Center and Marine Corps University, where he'll be talking about Iran's maritime strategies and tactics. We will see you then. Education is what's important. Training, preparation for the expected. Education, preparation for the unexpected.